I am really delighted to be talking about uh, our paper um, titled Disappearing Repositories, Taking an Infrastructure Perspective on the Long-Term Availability of Research Data. Um, this paper I published together with my co-authors Heinz Pampel, Ruben Schabinger and Nina Weisweiler. And in this paper, we looked at um, the maintenance of infrastructures in the context of research data, in particular, the influence on the long-term availability of research data sets themselves. I first want to start by giving some background on information, uh, some background information on infrastructures and infrastructure maintenance in the context of research data. In a nutshell, uh, research data repositories are information infrastructures that are specialized on handling research data. There are several types of repositories and they have different character characteristics depending on their user base. Some repositories you might know uh, or be familiar with are Zenodo, which is a very large repository operated by CERN in Switzerland. Um, and this repository is free to use by anyone. Or you might also be familiar with repositories such as Gene Expression Omnibus, which is a discipline specific repository that uh, focuses on um, uh, sequencing data. So a very specific area of research and specific data type. And as you all might know, funders, journals, and other stakeholders are increasingly mandating the publication of data on which publications are based. And research data repositories are essential components um, on the majority of publication workflows for research data. For example, um, these repositories make sure that data can be found, accessed, and remain usable. Therefore, they are very important for this specific open science practice, but there are also some implications for the long-term availability um, of research data, because research data can only be accessed long-term if the infrastructures that store them remain functional um, or if appropriate measures to, uh, to uh, maintain data are um, taken. This is why infrastructure maintenance is a necessary prerequisite for the preservation of research data. So the infrastructure maintenance and data um, preservation are linked. However, infrastructure maintenance is very challenging in general. Uh, you might be uh, aware of this in other areas such as transportation um, or electricity, for example but this also applies for information infrastructures. And one reason for um, why this is so challenging is that infrastructures have to um, kind of bridge different time scales. Um, among other things, infrastructures are characterized by the fact that they enable certain practices in the present, but also continue to support them in the future. So. Um, an infrastructure always has to do both. They have to support here and now practices and also um, kind of create uh, or assure people that they will remain usable in the future. And applied to the case of research data repositories, this means that they must be usable right now. They must su support current practices, but they also must remain usable in the future so they also need to um, anticipate uh, or collect current user needs, anticipate how they might shift and plan ahead. This is very challenging for repositories, um, which is kind of, um, uh, which you can see from a survey among repository operators where they reported that they found both the long-term planning challenging as well as developing new functionalities that uh, support users current and evolving practices. Typically, there are also different lifetimes within this, the same repository. Um, one typical example is that technical components usually become obsolete much more quicker than the database itself which can retain its analytical potential uh, long after um, technical components have kind of become deprecated. 
In addition, there are various risks that can have a negative impact on the operation of repositories, for example, um, risks con concerning financial, organizational, technical, or legal aspects. So as I have ho hopefully shown, um, it's quite challenging to keep repositories running. And from previous research, uh, we know that despite best efforts, infrastructure maintenance fails occasionally and repository shutdown occurs. And um, in this talk today, I want to um, kind of uh, give some insights into this phenomenon. And I want to start by looking at um, previous re research and how um, this uh, phenomenon was approached there. The first study I want to uh, briefly discuss is a um, study by Edward et al. that was published in 2015. And this was a study on the lifespan of biological databases. And this study was based on an archived version of a biological database registry, uh, which was called dbcat. And this was closed in 2006, but the authors uh, were able to access it um, via the Wayback Machine and they checked which databases on this list were still operational after 18 years. They found that 76% of the database, uh, databases on this list were either shut down or not updated in the last three years. Um, and this might sound very shocking, uh, but I will give some context on that later on. This approach um, can be considered very successful at determining the scale of the issue of repository shutdown, but only for the life sciences. And it's unclear um, to what extent the results of this study can be transferred to other disciplines or repository types. A more recent study did not restrict their scope to a specific discipline. Manachi et al. checked the HTTP status of links um, in repository registries to see if the URL still worked. They found that depending on the method they used, uh, only around 75% of the URLs returned a, an HTTP status starting with two, which indicates success. And the remaining URLs did not resolve as intended. This study also has limitations, um, mainly using the HTTP status um, of URLs in registries as proxies for the status of the infrastructure. But as I will um, explain later on, there are many reasons beside repository shutdown um, that could result in HTTP errors. Um, for example, uh, a repository reorganizing um, the websites, moving content from sites to other sites. Um, but I will give some examples later. So for um, in our in our uh, research project, we found that investigating repository shutdown can feel like hunting ghosts because the object of research uh, has vanished, but you might still be able to find um, traces of it. I will now talk you through some considerations um, for how we decided to structure our ghost hunt. So basically, we were interested in two things. We wanted to gain insights into the shutdown process and its reasons. And we also wanted to estimate how common the ph phenomenon was overall. We did consider different methods, for example, interviews with former operators of now defunct repositories, because this would give us um, very in-depth um, insights into the shutdown process. And we would be able to ask for reasons and um, just details of the process overall. However, we found that we could not get in touch with uh, repository operators of uh, or former operators of shutdown repositories because the contact information we found in registries or on repository websites was no longer valid. And um, so in essence, this approach was close to us. And it would also not be possible, possible to estimate how common the phenomenon was overall, because we would have to select specific um, cases to study. Another uh, approach similar to the study of 
databases in the life sciences I just talked about. Um, but uh, our approach would be, be based on a registry that covers all disciplines. This would be, um, this would facilitate the estimation of the prevalence of the phenomenon, but it would somewhat limit um, the ability to get insights on the repository shutdown process. Um, but we felt that we could counteract that by including additional materials into our analysis um, that would kind of fill that gap. So um, for these reasons, we decided to base our analysis on a registry and basically choose the second approach. Next, we had to select the registry um, we wanted to use uh, for our study. And generally, registries collect information about repositories, but not, not all of them have a focus on research data repositories specifically, and not all of them maintain records of closed repositories. Some registries remove entries of repositories after they are shut down because they want to focus on uh, repositories, repositories that are currently operational. And today, the biggest registry with a focus on research data repositories, um, and that does keep records of closed repositories, is re 3 data. Um, so therefore, we decided to, um, to use re 3 data metadata. Um, here I have an example of a re 3 data record. Um, I screenshotted uh, this entry a couple of days ago. Um, and here you can see the information you can get from a registry. You can get some basic um, information like the name, um, a repository URL, the subjects or content types the repository caters to, as well as a short description, um, identifiers uh, in other registries. And then you would also be able to get information on the institutions that operate the repository. Um, general terms and conditions and the standards the repository has implemented. But what you can also see is that the information on repository shutdown is very limited. Um, you can see that in the description, there is a short note that the um, database will be retired in 2022. Um, but you cannot see whether data was migrated to a new um, site after shutdown or what uh, reasons were behind the shutdown. However, uh, one <clears throat> very important piece of information um, that can be used to gather additional information on the, on the shutdown process is the repository URL. Um, you can use that to access the uh, current version of the repository, or you can look at older versions of the uh, website via the Internet Archive. For example, um, in the example uh, I gave here, sorry, um, the NCBI Biosystems Database, I accessed the uh, URL today, and you can see that um, there is a tombstone page, so it does not exist anymore. But you can see that there are several screenshots in the Internet Archive, and then you can kind of navigate back in time <clears throat> to the time before, during, or after the shutdown. And you can see if there was any additional information on the shutdown um, process listed on the website back then. Um, so this is very useful information to collect information. Um, Sometimes there's also additional sources that can be considered, for example, data papers that describe a repository. Um, so these are just brief descriptive papers that outline um, the content of a repository and its user base. Um, and sometimes you can get um, information from these sources as well. And sometimes um, there are also websites with additional information on the shutdown. For example, um, so-called database transition pages that uh, indicate where the vanished data can be accessed now. And these are very useful if you want to um, trace data custody over time. 
Um, we also noted that um, it is not always clear uh, when a repository is considered shut down or closed. In the literature, we found uh, very different uh, stages of closedness. Um, so for example, a repository can be fully closed, but it can also be rebranded or renamed. It can be scaled down, so only um, parts of services and collections are still accessible. Um, the repository could be archived, so it could be kind of sleeping, but not be fully dead yet. <laughs> um, or it could be disassembled and repurposed. And in some cases, a repository might even be just temporarily closed, but come back online after, for example, a prolonged maintenance phase. So um, <clears throat> that kind of makes things tricky and uh, kind of have to decide on a working definition of a closed repository for um, studies like this. And it's also important to decide what's the thing that needs to remain constant for a repository to, to be still considered operational. So uh, what has to be uh, intact for the database to consider it um, still operational? For example, a repository might move to a new URL or parts of it collect part of its collection might be transferred to another repository. And then you have to decide um, if that constitutes a shutdown or if it's just um, I don't know, a change. For our approach, we first identified repositories in Re3 data that were marked as closed. And from the more than 3,000 uh, repositories listed in Re3 data at the time, those were um, just roughly more than 200. Um, and then we reviewed each case to remove duplicates and entries that did not meet our inclusion criteria. And the inclusion criteria we defined were um, that a repository uh, was not accessible anymore under the original or a new URL, or if the repository website clearly stated that the service has ceased operations. Um, but sometimes uh, this was the case and there was still uh, limited access to the data. But um, for us, it was important that um, the uh, service stated itself that it was definitely closed. So in our definition, rebranding or relocating to a new URL is not considered a shutdown. Um, and also the content is not considered deprecated on it unless it's explicitly stated. So this is kind of a um, very inclusive definition. I think it kind of allowed for uh, changes, um, but it also gave clear boundaries what was included and what was not. So after applying these um, criteria, we arrived at a sample of 191 closed repositories. And uh, for these, um, we uh, collected additional information as described before. So we visited current and archived versions of the website, and we also checked any um, additional resources for information on the shutdown process. And I now want, you, want to give you a brief overview of some of our key findings um, before we move on to the Q&A. So we found that roughly more than 6% of all repositories indexed in Re3 data are closed. And since Re3 data, the registry we used uh, officially went live in 2012, at least one shutdown has been recorded every year. So it's fair to say that this is not a rare phenomenon, um, but it occurs fairly regularly. Um, I also want to stress that before 2012, the uh, coverage is likely sparse because um, the registry did not pick up operations officially before. Uh, it just picked up operations officially in 2012. Um, so the time before is likely not covered well in our study. 
We also checked for um, confirmed start and end dates of repositories, and we found both for 158 in total. Um, and for these, the median age at shutdown was 12 years. So 50% uh, of the repositories we looked at lasted 12 years, up to 12 years, and 50% uh, lasted longer. Uh, most of the repositories in the sample are discipline specific. Um, you can see that here in the uh, Venn diagram. And the majority also have a focus on the life sciences, which is uh, the green oval here, or the life, uh, no, the natural sciences, which is green here, and the life sciences, which is red. And um, uh, compared to all repositories in Re3 data, including the ones that are still operational, these groups are also overrepresented. Um, and I think at this stage, it's also important to note that both repository type and subject uh, can have overlaps in Re3 data. So it can occur multiple times. So that's why we uh, drew these Venn diagrams with the intersections. Looking at the risks that resulted in repository shutdown, uh, we found that for most repositories in the sample, it was not possible to determine um, the cause of shutdown. Um, this illustrates a problem that we have observed during data collection, that in many cases, there is only very sparse information, if any, on the shutdown process. Um, when sources provided inf information on uh, the reasons for closure, it was mostly related to organizational issues, um, such as um, the restructuring of a facility's resources or economic reasons. Um, other reasons included technical issues and also in uh, some rare cases, external um, security incidents. And in only one case, the data was considered obsolete. This kind of draws back to what I said earlier, that um, the data collection typically has a really long lifespan, um, though it can outlast the repository by decades. There are various strategies repositories can use to prevent data loss. And for our study, we looked at two of them. We looked at uh, maintaining limited access to data and data migration. And we found evidence that 12% uh, of the repositories in the sample maintained access to data, but only to a very limited extent. Um, this meant that, for example, there was still a very simple FTP interface in place, but you could no longer um, search for data or access individual data sets. And 44% of the repositories in the sample migrated the data to another repository. And what I find very notable is that roughly three quarters of the repositories did not mention any of these two options. Um, so I think in these cases, there is a very high risk of data loss at shutdown. Um, and the data also showed that in some cases, um, which is shown here in this uh, graphic, um, data sets were migrated several times because the repository that took over custody of the data uh, was later also closed. And in one case, we observed um, the chain of custody ended then because um, we found no evidence of a further data migration. But in other cases, the data was um, were migrated again and the chain of custody continued. It's also important to note that neither of these measures are permanent because they either seize any preservation activity or they simply shift the burden of infrastructure maintenance into the future. So unfortunately, there is no, um, no definite way of stopping uh, decay, but uh, only strategies that can buy you some time before you might have to take any additional measures. I want to conclude with um, a brief reflection of the method we used and our results. 
Um, from our perspective, uh, we would argue that repositories are important sources for tracing trajectories of repositories, including repository shutdown. But there is a significant lack of information on the circumstances of repository shutdown and anything that comes after, like data migration. Um, but we can say that in the case of Free3 data, um, the metadata schema was updated as a result of this study. Um, and it was updated to better reflect uh, transfers of data custody in the future. And this change will make it possible for users of the registry, uh, registry to trace data collections in case of repository shutdown. So um, if a user encounters a closed repository, they will be able to check with Rethu data if the um, data was transferred to another repository. And this change will be implemented somewhere uh, sometime in the near, near future. And our results show that repository is not a rare event. And that might sound bad, but it does not have to be a negative outcome because repository shut, shutdown can be planned for in advance and permanent data loss can be avoided. Um, however, uh, it's important to note that today the burden of data preservation uh, rests solely on individu individual repositories. So um, this means that research data are actually in a very precarious position. Ideally, this task should be distributed more evenly to reduce the risk of permanent data loss. And we think that a structure like a preservation network, um, like it exists um, for scholarly articles, uh, might be a useful solution here. And with this, uh, I come to the end of my presentation and I uh, look forward to your questions. <laughs>